Okay, so hi everybody, welcome back. What we're doing today is finishing up our chapter 32 lecture on reflection and refraction of light. So what we touched on last time at the end of the, the previous video was Snell's law. And remember, Snell's law is an equation that describes how light refracts or how it bends as it goes from one material to another. So let's start off this video with an example where we get to put Snell's law to use. So you may have noticed that when you look down into a pool of water from above, the pool looks less deep than it really is. In other words, let's say you're up here and you're looking straight down into this pool. It's going to appear to be less deep than it actually is. So let's suppose that the pool that we're talking about is filled with water to a depth of 12 meters. So D is equal to 12 meters. The question is, what is the apparent depth of the pool from the perspective of an observer looking at the bottom of the pool from up here, from above the surface of the water? Okay, so here's the idea behind this. If we take a look at this point, uh, which is actually at the bottom of the pool, and we follow a ray of light coming from that point, it's gonna refract upon going into the air, okay? And same with this ray, it's gonna refract after it goes into the air. Now, if you're looking down at the pool from above, these rays right here, the refracted rays, are what is actually entering your eye. So what you see is these refracted rays entering your eye. And if you trace those rays back, it looks like they're actually coming from here, from this red point. So the yellow point at the bottom of the pool is where the rays actually come from, but this red point is where we trace the refracted rays back, and that's where it appears they're coming from. Okay, so to us, that's where it's gonna look like they're coming from. And what's the depth of that uh, red point? Well, that's what we call the apparent depth, D prime. That's how deep the pool actually appears to be. So what we're gonna do is figure out D prime, and let's do that. Okay, so let's work this one out. Let's start by drawing the interface between air and water. So air is up here with index of refraction, let's call it N1, and the water is down here with index of refraction, let's call it N2. So this would be the interface between the two materials. The normal line is perpendicular to that. And so, of course, when we have a ray coming from the water and then into the air, it's going to be refracted. And this shows that the ray is bent as it travels into the air. Okay, so those two angles, uh, we can call them theta 1 for air, because we're just labeling air as uh, material number 1, and theta 2 for the water. And um, both of those angles are measured relative to the normal line. Okay, so let's say that this point down here, point B, is the bottom of the pool. Okay, and that's where rays actually originate. But if we follow the refracted ray back, as we said earlier, it looks like it's coming from over here, which I'll label as point A. So the depth below the surface of point A is what we call D prime. The depth below the surface of point B is what we call D. Okay, so point A is where rays appear to originate. All right then. Um, so there are a couple other things we can do with this picture. Um, I'm gonna draw another vertical line like this that goes through point A and then through point B. I'll notice that the first ray makes an angle 
theta 2 with respect to that vertical line because we have alternate interior angles there. And then I can also note that this angle between the line we traced back and the vertical line I just drew is theta 1. Okay? And then let's also call this distance here, this horizontal distance between those two vertical lines, let's call that x. Okay, so notice that we have two right triangles that we can pick out of the diagram. So the two right uh, triangles from the diagram are so we have one where this horizontal side is x and this vertical side is d prime and there's a right angle between those two sides and then theta one is the angle at the bottom here we have another triangle the larger one where we have the same horizontal side x but the vertical side is bigger, it's D, and the angle down here is theta two. And of course, there's a right angle between X and D. So with my first triangle, I can write down tangent theta one. That would be opposite over adjacent. So the opposite side would be X, the adjacent side would be D prime. Using the other triangle, tangent of theta two, that would give us opposite over adjacent x over d. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is to assume that the angles involved are small. So let's think about that for a second. This is actually a very valid assumption to make here because let's say this is your eye and the rays entering your eye, let's say there's one here and another one here, they're gonna have to be separated by a very small angle because they're entering a very small opening, which is the pupil of your eye. So assuming the angles are small is perfectly valid considering these rays are gonna be entering your eye. So, what can we say about small angles? Well, one thing we can say when you're dealing with small angles is that tangent theta, which is equal to sine over cosine, of course, will approximately be equal to, so we'll leave sine alone. When angles are small, cosine is approximately equal to one. So the lesson here is when you have small angles, Tangent and sine are pretty much the same thing. Okay, so that's going to be useful in what comes next, because if we apply Snell's law, which says n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, then that's approximately going to be equal to n1 times tangent theta 1, because again, sine and tangent are almost the same thing when it comes to small angles. That will approximately be equal to N2 times tangent theta two. And then based on the work we did above, we can plug in for tangent theta one, X over D prime. And then for tangent theta two, we can plug in X over D. So we want to know D prime. We want to know the apparent depth of the water in the pool. So D prime is equal to D times N1 over N2, if you solve for it. And so let's plug in what we know. The actual depth D is 12 meters, but N1, that's the air, is uh, index of refraction is equal to one. N2 is the water, index of refraction is equal to 1.33. And this comes out to 9.0 meters. So even though the pool is actually 12 meters deep, because of this optical illusion introduced by refraction, it only appears to be nine meters deep. So that would be the apparent depth. Okay, let's do another example.
So in this example, we have a ray of light traveling through air, where n is equal to 1, which enters a prism made of glass. So this is the ray entering the prism. And it enters at an angle of 37.5 degrees relative to the normal line of that surface that it's entering. Okay, the base of the prism is in the shape of a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So this angle is 30, this is 90, and this is 60 degrees. So it goes into the prism, it refracts, and then it exits the prism, and then it refracts one more time. So the question here is, at what angle does this ray leaving the prism uh, actually travel at? So what is this angle between this normal line here and the ray exiting the prism? So let's figure this out. Okay, so let's start by copying down the picture. We have a prism like this in the shape of a 30, 60, 90, 90 triangle. So this is the 30 degree angle up here, 60 degrees down here, and 90 degrees here. The index of refraction in air is equal to one. In the prism, it's equal to 1.54 because it's made out of glass. And so let's draw the uh, ray that's entering the prism like so. So this ray comes in at an angle of 37.5 degrees. Once it's uh, traveling in the prism, it's going to be refracted. And then it will travel in this straight line. And then it's going to exit the prism and it's gonna be refracted again. So now it's gonna be moving this way. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of different angles that we can label here. Let's call this angle alpha between the ray that is traveling inside the prism and the first normal line. Let's call this one beta, the angle between um, the second normal line in that ray that's traveling in the prism. And then how about we call this gamma, the angle that the final ray makes with respect to that second normal line. So gamma, we don't know, we're gonna figure it out. We can also take note of the fact that this angle is just equal to 90 minus alpha because together uh, that angle and alpha make up the normal line, which is at 90 degrees to the surface. And in a similar way, this angle is 90 minus beta because again, if you take that angle and you add it to beta, you should get 90 degrees because it's a normal line. And I think that's everything I wanted to label um, on this diagram. So let's start by apply uh, Snell's law. Let's start by applying Snell's law to the first interface. So here we're going to be using n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2. Okay, so in this case, um, the index of refraction of the first material is 1 because it's air. So n1 is just equal to 1. And then we have sine of 37.5 degrees. So that's the angle in the air. That should equal N2, which is now we're in the glass, which has index of refraction 1.54. And then we'll have sine of, we're calling this angle alpha. So we'll just leave it as alpha. So sine of alpha is equal to sine of 37.5 degrees over 1.54. And if you calculate that number, it works out to 0 0.3953 with three sig figs. So therefore, alpha is the inverse sine of that number. Alpha is the inverse sine of 0.3953, which, if you work it out, is 23.28 degrees. Okay, and we'll keep uh, three sig figs on that. Okay, so that's the angle alpha. 
The next thing we'll note is that if we look at this upper triangle, which I'll circle for you right here. Okay, so in that triangle, the angles must sum to 180 degrees. So angles in the upper triangle um, must sum to 180 degrees. So, okay, we have 30 degrees. Um, we also have 90 minus alpha. We also have 90 minus beta. So those three angles sum to 180. Notice how um, 90 plus 90 is equal to 180, so these cancel here. Then we get 30 degrees is equal to, if we put alpha and beta on the other side, it's 30 degrees is equal to alpha plus beta. So the angle beta is 30 minus alpha, which is 30 minus 23.28 degrees. And since we're subtracting here, um, should be a little more specific. This is 30.0, right? So this is 30.0 degrees minus uh, 23.28 degrees, which gives you um, 6.72 degrees. But we keep the lowest number of decimal places. So we only round to the first decimal place in this case. So the next thing we do as we apply Snell's law at the second interface. So here, let's write down the equation. We have N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two. So, the first material is glass, which is 1.54. And the angle is beta, which is 6.72 degrees. So that's N1 times sine theta 1. Since we're exiting the prism and going into the air, N2 is equal to 1. And we don't know the angle that that uh, final ray comes out at, uh, but we're calling it gamma in our diagram, so let's just call it gamma. So what we have is sine of gamma is equal to 1.54 times the sine of 6.72 degrees, which, if you actually compute that number, is 0 0.1802 with two sig figs. So therefore gamma is equal to the inverse sine of that number, which if you compute it in degrees, comes out to like 10.38 degrees. So about 10 degrees, 10 degrees. So that's how you do this one. Okay, so let's take that previous example as kind of a jumping off point to talk about dispersion of light. So what happened in the previous example is we had a light ray coming in and then hitting this interface between air on this side and glass on this side. And so as it enters the glass, it gets refracted. In other words, the ray gets bent. And then again, when we hit this interface, going from the glass back out into the air, the ray gets refracted one more time, it gets bent again. So it turns out that the index of refraction for a material like glass actually depends on the wavelength of the light somewhat. So in other words, red light is going to have a slightly different end value than let's say blue light. And red light will have a smaller end value as it turns out. So as a result of that, light rays that have different wavelengths are going to get refracted at different angles, okay, because the end value is different. Um, and what that looks like is, let's say we have red light, which has a smaller end value. It's going to get refracted at a smaller angle, so that's what you see here. 
Whereas blue light, which has a larger end value, gets refracted at a bigger angle. And so let's say we're putting into this prism white light. So we have a beam of white light coming in, which by the way is just a mixture of waves with all the different wavelengths in the visible spectrum. So you have red, orange, yellow, blue, and so on, all mixed together in white light. So if we send white light through the prism, well, the different colors, again, are gonna be refracted at different angles. So red light's gonna come out this way, orange light is gonna come out that way, and then blue and violet are gonna be refracted the most. So what's happening here is we're separating out the white light into those component colors. So you can actually break the white light up into the different colors of the rainbow. And when we do this, this effect is called dispersion. So when we use something like a glass prism to separate out white light into these component colors, we call that dispersion. And this happens in a lot of different ways. It's not just with a prism, but that's one sort of simple tool you can use to uh, break white light up into the different colors. And by the way, you might have seen this sort of uh, thing before. If you listen to the band Pink Floyd, that's the album cover for uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Okay, so here's a question for you guys. Let's say we have a light ray that hits the interface of two materials while it's traveling completely perpendicular to the interface. So we have one material up here, another material down here, and the incident light ray, the one that's coming in, is traveling completely perpendicular to the interface. What's the direction of the transmitted ray in this case? So pause the video, try to figure this out, and then come back to it when you think you have your answer. Okay, so let's start just by writing down uh, Snell's law because we're gonna be using this. It says N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two, where in this case, uh, we have the interface between two materials here. Let's say N1 is the index of refraction of the material on top. And then N2 is uh, the index of refraction of the material on the bottom. So the incident ray is coming in like this, completely perpendicular to the interface, like we said. And so what's the angle theta one for that incident ray? Well, remember, we always measure the angle relative to the normal line. So the line that's you know, perpendicular to the interface. Well, in this case, uh, the incident ray and the normal line are in the same exact direction, so there's no angle between them. Theta one is equal to zero. So if we plug that into Snell's law for theta one, we have N one sine of zero equals N two sine theta two. And we solve for sine theta two which is equal to n1 over n2 times, again, sine of zero. It doesn't matter what n1 and n2 are equal to because sine of zero ends up being zero. So sine of theta two is equal to zero. What does that mean theta two is equal to? Well, zero, right? So if you take the inverse sine of zero, in other words, you're gonna get zero out. Okay, that means the refracted ray is also at zero degrees to the normal line, which means the direction hasn't even changed, okay? So in this one special case where the incident ray hits the interface at um, perpendicular to the interface like this, the refracted ray is actually not going to change direction. It's still going to be moving the same way. Now for any other angle, of course, let's say the ray came in like this, then the refracted ray would be moving in a different direction. Okay, but in the special case, they actually uh, don't change direction at all. Okay, so the next topic here is something called total internal reflection. And in order to understand this, we're just gonna be using Snell's law. So 
The same basic setup uh, for Snell's law is still gonna apply here. We have one material, let's call it material number one with index of refraction N1 and another material down here with index of refraction N2. And let's just say that for this derivation, N1 is bigger than N2. So that means the light is moving from a region of high index of refraction to, an in, uh, to a region of lower index of refraction. So we're going from high to low N. Now, if the incident ray, this ray right here, is coming in perpendicular to the interface, well, we already saw what happens. The refracted ray is gonna come out also perpendicular to the interface. In other words, if theta one is equal to zero, then theta two is also uh, equal to zero. On the other hand, if we change theta one, so it's like, I don't know, 10 degrees, something that's not zero, then theta two is gonna be even bigger than theta one. That's because N1 is bigger than N2. That ensures that theta two is gonna be bigger than theta one. If you look at Snell's law, you can kind of convince yourself of that. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you an animation where we increase theta one from zero degrees where it is now uh, and just increase it, increase it, increase it. And we'll see how theta two also increases at the same time. So here's what we have. So notice theta two is bigger than theta one. And at some point we have a value of theta one where the corresponding value of theta two is equal to 90 degrees. See that? This is 90 degrees now. And so if we increase theta one past this, then basically what's happening is there is no refracted ray anymore. There is no ray that's going into the second material. And what we call that when theta two goes to 90 degrees is total internal reflection because you're actually not getting any light going in to the second material. The only thing that can happen is it gets reflected back into the first material. So as theta two goes to 90 degrees, um, theta one is approaching what we call the critical angle, okay? So the critical angle is the angle of incidence, which corresponds to an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. So let's do a little bit of math to figure out what the formula for the critical angle is gonna be. Okay, so we'll start with Snell's law once again which says N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. And what we're doing in this case is we're saying theta one is going to this uh, critical angle, which we call theta crit, and theta two is going to 90 degrees. So we have N1 sine theta crit equals N2 sine 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees goes to one. So sine of theta crit is just N2 divided by N1, or if we solve for the critical angle, theta crit is equal to the inverse sine of N2 over N1. That's how we get the critical angle. Okay, so the formula that we've derived for the critical angle is theta crit is the inverse sine of N2 over N1. So it only depends on the two indices of refraction for the two different materials we're talking about. Now, if we have the angle of incidence, the angle that the light is coming in, greater than the critical angle, it's physically impossible for any light to actually be transmitted across the interface. If theta one is bigger than the critical angle, there's just no way a ray can go into the second material. So the only possibility is that this ray just gets reflected back into the first material. And what we call this is total internal reflection. When any light coming in is just reflected back into the first material, we call that total internal reflection. 
That's what happens if this angle is bigger than the critical angle. Okay, so here's a good example of what that looks like. Um, we have a piece of glass, and outside of the piece of glass is just air. So the boundary, or the interface we're talking about, is between glass and air. Now, glass has a bigger index of refraction than air. And so if we look at this light ray coming in and hitting the interface, well, we, we're going basically from high to low index of refraction, right? Just like we said before. And if this angle is big enough, if it's past the critical angle, then again, it's impossible for any light to go out into the air. The only thing that can happen is the light will reflect off of that interface and then go back this way. And, and the same thing is gonna happen at the next interface. Again, the only thing that can happen here is the light will just reflect back off into the glass. And so the light is sort of trapped in the glass. It's just bouncing around inside of the glass. It's not able to escape. So this is actually a very important effect. It has a lot of really important technological applications. And I left a, a link to a video. It's a really short video that explains uh, a little bit more about how this works and some of those technological applications. So click the link here if you want to see more about that. Okay, so you may have heard of fiber optics before. This is the idea that information can be transmitted over very long distances using pulses of light. And these pulses of light will then travel down a glass or a plastic strand, which we call an optical fiber. So this picture here shows you a whole bunch of optical fibers. You can see that light is able to travel down those plastic strands um, and it's coming out of the end of those optical fibers. So first of all, how is it that we can transfer information using pulses of light? Well, that's pretty simple. Um, if the light is on, that can be interpreted as a one. And if the light is off, that can be interpreted as a zero. And a sequence of zeros and ones is all you need to transfer information using binary code. So just a big long list of zeros and ones is all you need. You can transfer that list by using pulses of light. Whenever the light is off, that's a zero. Whenever it's on, that's a one. So the reason this works, the reason you can actually send the light uh, down these optical fibers is that total internal reflection is going on inside of the optical fiber. So if we look at the uh, more detailed structure of the optical fiber, it's basically a bunch of cylinders concentric to one another. So at the very uh, inner part of the optical fiber, we have what's called the core. Again, this is gonna be made of usually plastic or glass. And then surrounding that is something called the cladding. And then everything else that surrounds that is just sort of protective material. So we have some kind of coating and then some kind of outer jacket. But the really interesting physics is happening here with the core and the cladding. So if the index of refraction of the core is bigger than the cladding, then we can get total internal reflection happening inside of the core. Just like I showed you earlier, the light is not gonna be able to escape the core. It's just gonna bounce around back and forth inside of it because there's total internal reflection happening inside of the core. And so no matter how you bend or uh, kind of distort the cables, as long as you're not bending it too much, you can get the light pulse to stay inside of the core and it will just be guided along the cable um, no matter what. So this type of technology is often used in computer networks. Uh, we can transmit telephone signals this way or cable TV signals. Um, this is something that's just all around us, uh, fiber optics. Okay. So here's a question for you guys to think about. What is the critical angle for light traveling from water into air? The relevant values for the index of refraction are given in this table. So just look up N for air and N for water, and you should be able to calculate this critical angle. So pause the video, see if you can get this, and then we'll go through it together. 
Okay, so the basic idea here is that we have the interface between air and water. So let's call the air material number two, N2, and let's call the water material number one, N1. And so the idea is if this is the normal line, we have um, a ray coming in at some angle theta one, and then being refracted at some angle theta two once it enters the air. So remember, as theta one goes to the critical angle, theta two is going to 90 degrees. So from Snell's law, which says N one sine theta one equals N two sine theta two, we have N one sine theta critical equals N two sine 90, which is just one. So sine theta critical is equal to N2 over N1. Theta critical is the inverse sine of N2 over N1. Okay, so we already knew that, right? So if we plug in the relevant values here, N2 should be the index of refraction of air, which is basically just one. It's very, very close to one. The index of refraction for water, on the other hand, is about 1.33. So the inverse sine of one over 1.33, if you work it out, is about 48.75 degrees, or about 48.8 degrees. So in other words, if this angle theta one is any bigger than 48.8 degrees, then you're actually not going to get a ray coming out into the air. It's going to be total internal reflection. That's the critical angle. Um, that's what we found. So another interesting effect that we can understand by applying Snell's law is something called Snell's window. So here's the idea. Let's say you're underwater and you're looking up towards the surface of the water, what you're gonna see is all of the light coming from above the surface of the water appears to be compressed. It appears to be compressed into a circle that spans about 97 degrees. And what we call that is Snell's window. So a couple photographs kind of spell out what's going on here. Uh, this one on the left is showing you um, a photograph taken by a scuba diver who's looking up towards the surface of the water. So notice how all of that light coming in from above is compressed into this window. And then outside of that, it's all dark. Okay, so all of the light coming in from above, again, is compressed into this sort of narrow window. Here's another picture, uh, which looks a little bit different, but it's actually illustrating the same effect. This one is taken uh, from underwater in a pool. Okay, so we're looking up at the surface of the water from a pool. So here you can see Snell's window. Okay, this is where all of the light coming from above the water is compressed into. And then outside of that window, all we're seeing is reflected light coming from below the surface. So notice how Let's say over here, we're just seeing a reflection of the bottom of the pool. Okay, and over here, we're, we're just seeing again a reflection of the bottom of the pool. The only light coming from above the surface, again, is compressed into that window, which we call Snell's window. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just show you why does this happen and why is it that that uh, window spans about 97 degrees? So let's work this out. Okay, so if we want to see what's going on here, let's start by drawing a diagram. So this line is the interface between the two materials. So above this line, we have air. Uh, let's call this N1. That's equal to one. Down here, we have water. Let's call the index of refraction N2, um, which is equal to 1.33. So let's show a light ray coming from the air going into the water. 
So it comes in like this. Let's say the angle here is theta one. And then after entering the water, it's refracted. So now it's moving at a different angle, theta two. And let's show the same thing happening, let's say on the left side here. So we have a ray of light coming in at an angle theta one and then being refracted at an angle theta two. Okay, so eventually those two rays are gonna meet. And this angle right here, which I'll call um, alpha between those two rays, is eventually what we're going to want to find. Okay, because that's the size of the window. Now, the thing to notice is that all of the light coming from above, all of the light coming from above the surface, um, is coming in at an angle, which we call theta one, which is less than or equal to 90 degrees, right? 90 degrees is as big as that angle can get. Once you set it to 90 degrees, you're actually including all of the light coming in from above the surface. So what we'll do is we'll set theta one to 90 degrees. So sine or N one times sine theta one equals N two times sine theta two so, okay, we have N1, which is um, 1. And then we have sine of theta 1, which is sine of 90, equaling N2, which is 1.33 times sine of theta 2. We're going to solve for theta 2. Sine of theta 2, that's going to be 1 over 1.33, because, again, sine of 90 is just equal to 1. So if we want theta two, that's gonna be the inverse sine of one over 1.33. Actually, that's just the critical angle that we found earlier, okay? Which is 48.8 degrees. Okay then, so if we go back to the diagram, I'm gonna draw another vertical line that cuts this triangle in half like this. And then we'll notice that this angle right here is theta two. It's an alternate interior angle to this guy. And this angle is also theta two. It's alternate interior angle to this guy. So in other words, the angle that we're looking for alpha which is the size of Snell's window, is just two times theta two, or two times 48.8 degrees, which is like 97.6 degrees. That's approximately the size of Snell's window. So again, all of the light coming from above appears to be compressed into this window with an angle of about 97.6 degrees. So that's how you do this one. All right, so that's all the content from chapter 32 that I wanted to cover. And since we have a little bit of extra time, I thought I would spend the rest of the video just going through some of the practice problems at the end of the lecture. So we have a number of problems here. Uh, let's try this one. So we have light traveling through three different materials as shown in this diagram. So the first material uh, has an index of refraction N1 is equal to 1.54. The next one is N2, which is equal to 1.33. And the next one is N3, which is equal to 1.13. So those are the three different layers of three different materials. Each layer is 13.5 centimeters thick. So what we're going to try to do is find the horizontal distance traveled X through all three layers uh, shown here. 
So in order to do this calculation, one other piece of information that we're gonna need is what is the angle that the uh, original ray comes in? That's gonna be um, theta one is equal to 23.5 degrees. So using that, we're gonna find the horizontal distance x. Okay, so the first thing we'll notice is that the distance x we're looking for can be broken up into three parts. x1, that's the horizontal distance traveled through the first material, plus x2, that would be the horizontal distance traveled through the second material, plus x3, that's what we're looking for. Now, if we go to the diagram, we'll notice that this angle here is the same as theta one, and that forms a nice right triangle. So, theta one is up here, this is a right angle, and then x1 would be this horizontal distance we're looking for. And then let's call the thickness of that layer uh, the vertical distance, t. So we'll notice that tangent of theta 1, which is, of course, the um, opposite side over the adjacent side, is going to be x1, that's the opposite side, divided by t, that's the adjacent side. So x1 is equal to t, the thickness of that layer, times tangent of theta 1. Now, if we go to the next layer down, this uh, ray that enters material number 2 is refracted, so there's a new angle here, theta 2. And from that, we can get a similar-looking triangle, where this angle is theta 2 now. The horizontal distance is x2. And the thickness is the same thing, t. So x2 is equal to t times tangent theta 2. And if we do this for the third layer, we'll find that x3 is equal to t times tangent theta 3 by the same exact reasoning that we used for uh, x1. So therefore, x total is going to be, I have a factor of t out front, the thickness of each layer. And then I'll have tangent theta 1 plus tangent theta 2 plus tangent theta 3. That will give me the distance I'm looking for. So how can we find all of those angles? Well, theta 1 we already know. Theta 2 I'm going to figure out using Snell's law. So here, we'll apply Snell's law at the... Uh, interface between 1 and 2. And that's going to give us um, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. Um, and so if we work this out, n1 is 1 1.54 sine of theta 1, theta 1 is 23.5 degrees. That equals N2, which is 1.33, times sine theta 2. Okay. Sine theta 2 is going to be 1.54 sine 23.5 degrees divided by 1.33, which is equal to, um, if you crunch this whole thing, um, 0 0.4617. So we have sine of theta 2 is equal to 0 0.4617, which means theta 2 is equal to the inverse sine of that. Now, if you calculate the inverse sine of that number, you're going to get 27.49 seven degrees. So that should be theta two. And we'll keep three sig figs on that. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is Snell's law again at the next interface. So the interface between um, material two and three. So we have N two sine theta two equals n3 sine theta 3. 
So here's what we're talking about. This is theta two. This is theta three. And if we want to solve for theta three, we can apply Snell's law by comparing uh, what's going on at two and three. So what's N two? That's 1.33. Then we take sine of theta two, which we just found is 27.497 uh, degrees. Now that's equal to N three, which is 1.13. And that multiplies sine theta 3. So sine theta 3, if we solve for that, is 1.33 times sine of 27.497 degrees divided by 1.13. And if you crunch those numbers, this works out to 0.5434. So theta 3 is the inverse sine of 0 0.5434. And if you calculate that, you'll get 32.92 degrees. So we're going to use all of those numbers we calculated in the formula for x. So x is the thickness of each layer t. So here, t is equal to this 13.5. Uh, five centimeter thickness, so we have 13.5 centimeters for T. And then I have tangent of theta one, which is 23.5 degrees, plus tangent theta two, which is 27.497 degrees from the calculation we did uh, just a second ago. And then we have tangent theta three, which is 32.5 Nine two degrees. Okay. So calculate that, crunch those numbers, and you're going to find it comes out to 21.63 centimeters, which rounds to 21.6 centimeters. So 21.6 centimeters, that's the distance X shown here. That's the horizontal distance traveled by the light as it goes through these three different materials. Okay, let's take a look at another example. This one comes from the chapter 16 lecture on sound. And in this scenario, we have a speaker which is emitting some sound waves. We're gonna assume that the speaker is an isotropic source. That means it's gonna follow the inverse square law. We have a listener. Um, we'll label this person as listener A who is 45 meters to the right of that speaker. There's another person 125 meters below where listener A is located. Let's call this guy listener B. And the question we want to answer here is, how much greater is the sound level at the position of listener A compared to listener B? So how many more decibels do we have at the position of listener A compared to listener B? Let's figure this out. For this one, we can start by writing down the definition of sound level. Remember, this is given by beta, which is 10 times the log base 10 of I divided by I naught. I is the actual sound intensity. I naught is a reference intensity. and the value is 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. But here, we're not interested in calculating a sound level. What we want is the difference between two sound levels. So let's do beta A minus beta B. So the difference between the sound level that listener A hears and listener B hears. So this will be 10 times the log base 10 of the intensity for listener A divided by I naught minus 10 log base 10 of intensity B divided by I naught. So we can simplify this. For one, there's a common factor of 10 out in front of both of these terms. 
And then we can actually bring uh, the two logs together as one, since we're subtracting two logarithms, that's the same as division. So in other words, we have I A divided by I naught over I B divided by I naught in the same logarithm. Uh, that's what we can do. And so we can cancel out I naught. It doesn't actually matter for our purposes what that reference intensity is because we just get 10 times log base 10 of the intensity at point A divided by the intensity at point B. Okay, so next, we're going to employ the inverse square law. This says that when we have an isotropic source, so it radiates sound evenly in all directions, the intensity is going to be given by the power output of the speaker in this case, divided by four pi times r squared. So one thing we can do with this is rearrange the equation to say i times r squared is equal to the power output of the speaker divided by four pi. Now all of this right here on the right hand side, the power of the speaker and four pi, is just one big constant so one way we can interpret the inverse square law is a statement that i times r squared is a constant. So i a times r a squared is equal to i b times r b squared. Then we have i a divided by i b. That's inside of the logarithm up here. So we want to figure out what i a divided by i b is. Well, from the inverse square law, that's going to be RB divided by RA, all squared. Okay, so what is RA? That's the distance between the speaker and listener A. So that would just be the 45 meters. On the other hand, RB would be the distance between the speaker and listener B. And in this case, we're going to have the square root of 45 meters squared plus 125 meters squared by the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so when it comes time to use those numbers, uh, we'll use them. And so going back to the difference in sound level, beta A minus beta B, what we have is 10 times the log base 10 of IA divided by IB, which we just said is equal to RB divided by RA, all squared. Okay, so another thing we can do is we can take this power of two that's inside the logarithm and put it out front. So this is the same as 20 times the log base 10 of RB divided by RA. Okay, now let's just plug in the numbers. We have 20 times the log base 10. RB uh, from up here is the square root of 45 meters squared plus 125 meters squared divided by RA, which is 45 meters. If you uh, compute that, it comes out to 9.4 and this is measured in decibels. So in other words, the sound is 9.4 uh, 9 decibels louder at the position of listener A compared to listener B. Okay, let's do another example from the chapter 16 lecture. In this case, we have two speakers. Uh, one of the speakers is at the origin. Let's call this speaker number two. The other one is 4.5 meters above that along the y-axis. That's speaker number one. Now these two speakers are in phase and they're both playing a tone with a frequency of 250 hertz. We have a listener who starts at the location of speaker number two, but then moves along the x-axis. So when the listener is located at x equals 2.32 meters, is he at a point of constructive interference 
destructive interference, or neither. We'll take the speed of sound in the air to be 343 meters per second. Let's work this out. All right, so let's start by drawing a picture of what's going on here. We have speaker number one, speaker number two directly below that, and then the listener directly to the right of speaker number two. So we have a couple distances we can label. The distance between speaker number one and speaker number two, let's call that um, H. So H is equal to 4.50 meters. That's just given to us. The distance between speaker number two and the listener, um, let's call that D. And again, we know the value from the problem is 2.32 meters. Let's also note that there's a right angle here between um, these two lines. And so here's the way we're going to tackle this problem, okay? We're first gonna look at the path length difference between the two sound waves that are reaching the listener. So we're gonna have one that's coming from speaker number one. It's gonna travel the distance x, let's call it x1, to get to the listener. We'll have another sound wave that is coming from speaker number two, and it will have to travel a distance x2 to get to the listener. So x1, is the hypotenuse of this triangle that we've just constructed. So by the Pythagorean theorem, it's gonna be the square root of d squared plus h squared. Whereas x2 is just the same as d. And of course the path length difference, delta x is simply gonna be given by x1 minus x2 or the square root of d squared plus h squared minus d. And for that, we can actually put a number to it. We have the square root of 2.32 meters squared plus 4.50 meters squared. So all of that is under the square root and then minus 2.32 meters. If you work this out, it's 2.74 meters. In other words, the wave coming from speaker number one has to travel 2.74 meters more than the wave coming out of speaker number two in order to get to the listener. Okay, so let's just put that to the side. Another thing we can calculate is the wavelength. V is equal to lambda times f, which means the wavelength lambda is equal to V over F. So for the wavelength we have, the speed of sound in the air, which is 343 meters per second, divided by F, which is 250 hertz or 250 inverse seconds. Now this works out to 1.37 meters. Okay, so we have two numbers to compare. We have the path length difference delta x, and we have the wavelength, lambda. Let's take the ratio between those two. Let's take delta x divided by lambda. This comes out to 2.74 meters divided by 1.37 meters, and that is exactly equal to two. And that tells us that we're dealing with constructive interference. Okay, because remember, when we have constructive interference, the path length difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength. So, in other words, the constructive interference condition says that delta x is equal to n times lambda for n is equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on. In this case, n happens to be equal to 2, but clearly we're meeting the condition for constructive interference. So that's how we do this one.
Okay, so let's go all the way back now to chapter 15, to the lecture on mechanical waves, and let's try this problem. So here we have a sinusoidal wave, which is propagating along a string in the negative x direction with a speed of 12.3 meters per second. The graph below shows a snapshot of the wave at t equals zero. Find the equation for the wave on the string, which is d as a function of x and t. Okay, so let's figure this out. Okay, so let's copy down that picture that we were given. And remember that this is what the wave looks like at t is equal to zero. Also, the speed of the wave v is 12.3 meters per second. So this is all the information we have. This is all we're going to need. And let's remember what the general solution for a sine wave moving in one dimension. Uh, let's remember what this general solution looks like. We have d as a function of x and t is equal to a times sine kx minus or plus omega t plus phi. That's the general solution. So in order to get the specific solution for this situation, we're just going to find all the constants, which are a, k, omega, and phi. And then as soon as we do that, we have the solution. So there are a few things we can get directly from the graph. The first would be the amplitude. The amplitude of a wave is just the maximum height above zero or the maximum displacement above zero that that wave achieves. So in this case, we can see that the amplitude is 10 centimeters. Now the wavelength is the distance between two peaks of the wave. So that's lambda. And from the graph, we can see, okay, well, this peak is at 20 meters. And the other peak is at four meters. So 16 meters is the wavelength. So that's pretty much all the information that we can glean just by looking at the uh, graph. So next, we're going to make a couple calculations. First, we're going to remember that V is equal to lambda F. That's the fundamental relationship between speed, wavelength, and frequency. So we can use this to calculate the frequency F. That's V over lambda. And so V is 12.3 meters per second. Lambda is 16 meters. So this comes out to 0.769 inverse seconds. Okay, next we can calculate omega. Omega is just equal to two pi times f. So that would be two pi times 0.769 inverse seconds, which would work out to 4.83 radians per second. Okay, next we can calculate the constant uh, k. k is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. So that would be 2 pi over 16, um, which would be pi divided by 8, uh, 16 meters, by the way, down here. So this would be uh, radians per meter as a unit. And in decimal form, that's just 0.393 radians per meter. Okay, so we've got omega, we've got k, we've got the amplitude. The only thing that really remains here is to figure out, well, in the equation up here, are we going to use the positive or uh, the negative sign? So the rule is this. You use the positive sign if moving in the negative x direction. You use the negative sign if moving in the positive x direction. So this wave happens to be moving in the negative x direction. So we're going to use the positive sign. Okay, 
The last thing to get is phi. That's called the phase of the wave, the phase angle. The way we're going to get this is we're going to plug in 0 for x and 0 for t into the original function. So we have a times sine of k times 0 for x. Then we have plus omega times plugging in 0 for the time. And then that's plus phi. So this would be equal to a times sine of phi. So from the graph, we can see that the displacement of our wave, when x is equal to 0 and when t is equal to 0, well, the displacement is 0. So what we can do is set a sine phi equal to 0. So we have sine of phi equals 0. What's phi going to be? Well, just 0. So the final answer for d of x and t is we have a, which is 10 centimeters, times sine of k, which is um, point, uh, yeah, point 0.393 radians per meter times x, and then plus omega, which is 4.83 radians per second times t. So that would be the solution for this particular sine wave. Okay, so there are plenty of other practice problems at the end of the lecture that you can take a look at. And definitely uh, do these for practice as you study for the upcoming test. But we'll end this video here. So I'll see you in the next one. And as always, be safe out there, be healthy, take care.